Well, good morning to each of you. So glad that y'all decided to join us today at our 930 service on this holiday weekend. Uh, I would have to pause and give a moment of shout out to Pastor Allen. Can we give it up for Pastor Allen for sharing with us, man? Oh, my goodness. Uh, he is a blessing to our church. Uh, while Jason and I are the lead pastors here at Bayside Blue Oaks, we, we follow Pastor Allen, man. Just seeing somebody do uh, ministry and be faithful to God for this long uh, is a blessing and something that I aspire to. Uh, Pastor Allen, you know this, but you are a mentor and a friend to all of us, and we love you. Come on, give it up for Pastor Allen one more time uh, for serving our country. Also want to acknowledge those of you today who may have lost a service member uh, at some point in time in your life. We're praying for you this weekend and thinking about you uh, as well, praying God's best for you, that he would comfort you during this time. Uh, if you're brand new around here, my name is Jason. I'm glad that you decided to come to church on a holiday weekend. So many things you could be doing. You could be out at the lake, but you decided to come to church. Uh, so I thank you for doing that. Whether you're watching online, if you're on a lake online, uh, don't feel guilty, but you should. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. Uh, hopefully you're having a great time on your boat. Last thing you're probably doing is watching me preach, so I'm giving myself way too much credit. Uh, but if you're watching the church in the park, we thank you that you're here uh, as well. Uh, we're continuing the series that we've been, over, been in over the past couple of weeks on the uh, Sermon on the Mount, uh, which is a sermon that Jesus gave that really is his longest discourse or his longest sermon that you can find in all of the Scripture. Uh, the sermon is found in Matthew chapter 5 through Matthew chapter 7, and Jesus preaches literally on a variety of subjects, almost every subject uh, he touches on at some point in time during this message. Uh, we have finally made it to chapter number 6. We spent uh, a lot of time in chapter number 5. Uh, so let me give a brief overview of what was discussed in chapter number 5 uh, for those of you who are just jumping on to this series. Uh, in chapter number 5, as Jesus begins his message, he lets people know that this is the way that you live a blessed life. Uh, during Jesus' time, the religious leaders of his day were known as the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were like the pastors and the preachers and the ones who were in charge of the church. But Jesus, when he gives this sermon, flips their idea of what it looks like to follow God upside down. And he challenges them, challenges what they have to say to demonstrate to people what it really looks like to live for God. In chapter number five, Jesus says, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are mourned. Blessed are those who are merciful. Blessed are the peacemakers. These were all things that would have went directly against the religious leaders of his day. The religious leaders of his day would have thought that blessed are those not who mourn, but who are happy. They would say, blessed are those not who are humble, but those who are haughty, those who have a high level of arrogance, those who are able to stand in the public square and look good externally, but Jesus knew internally there was something happening with them. Jesus then calls his people to be salt and light. He says, if you're going to follow me, you need to make the world better and you need to make the world brighter. Jesus says that my followers are the ones who bring light to a dark world. And the world was certainly dark during Jesus' day. We are in a dark world today. How many of y'all will admit to that? We live in a dark world. But the good news for all of us is we've been called to be light and you can shine brightest in dark places. As believers, we don't run from the dark. We don't try to escape the darkness. We don't pretend that the darkness does not exist. No, we influence the darkness by bringing the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to a world that desperately needs it. Listen, y'all, the darker the world gets, the louder the message of Jesus Christ should be, that he is gracious, that he is loving, he is kind, and he has a better life for people than the darkness has. I believe that God wants us to shine brightly in the world today. He moves on to that to talking about some specifics about anger and divorce and marriage. And he really raises the standard to say, hey, you Pharisees and Sadducees try to act like you've got life under control. You try to judge other people for being murderers, but you've murdered them by eliminating them in your mind, by having anger towards them. Jesus says you find ways to escape or to keep your word and keep your oath. And Jesus challenges them. And at this point, if Pharisees and Sadducees were in the crowd, they would have been upset with what Jesus had to say. In chapter number six, he continues preaching and teaching, and he moves from external good deeds and external things that make people righteous, that's what the Pharisees thought were necessary, to talking internally about people's motives. If the first chapter was difficult, this next chapter is even more difficult because it looks internally at the heart to search what motivates us to do good, to do good and be good in the world around us. What is your core motivation? Why is it that you come to church? Why do you follow after Jesus? Is it for social status? Why do you do what you do? Do you do it for money? Do you do it to feel good about yourself, to make others think that you're good, to be seen by others? Jesus is going to challenge all of this 
in chapter number 6. So let's look at uh, Matthew chapter 6. We'll read verse 1 through 4, but we'll actually preach from verses uh, 1 through 9 today. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, it says this. These are the words of Jesus. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that in your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. Let's continue to read verse 5 through 9. And when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners and to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, don't be like the babbling, like pagans, for they think they will hear be heard, excuse me, because of their many, many words. Verse 8, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. As we're going through the Sermon on the Mount, we're just going verse by verse and phrase by phrase to expound upon what Jesus, or explain what Jesus has said. So we'll start in verse number 1. It says this, be careful not to practice your righteousness to be seen by others. Jesus, as he is talking to his followers and those who are gathered around him on the hillside to hear this Sermon on the Mount, he says to them, be careful. Now, in our English translation, it sounds like a soft and kind warning, but really, Jesus would have been saying, be on alert. This would have been a word that caused everybody's ears to perk up in order to listen to what Jesus has to say. This word, beware, means to watch out for, to be on guard against, to give heed. It was if you were about to get in a car accident and the person next to you says, watch out. Jesus says, I want to warn you, be careful that you do not do your righteousness before man. Jesus is being very emphatic here that I want you to be careful because there is imminent danger around if you don't pay attention, if you're not aware, if you don't stand guard. Uh, every once in a while, I go back to Atlanta to see my family. That's where I'm from. And my dad uh, has gotten this process where he's kind of like a security guard for me, uh, and he warns me about everything going bad in the city of Atlanta, and he thinks because uh, I'm his son, I'm uh, he treats me like a little boy in some ways. I'm going to just be honest and say it that way. <laughs> he says some phrases to me. He says, be careful, son. You don't want to go get gas at night in Atlanta anymore. Like, what if I need gas? He said, it's too dangerous. Don't go get gas at night. I'm like, okay, Dad, thank you. <laughs> he says, be careful where you park when you go downtown Atlanta. They're breaking in cars left and right. You won't have any windows, so be careful where you park. And he knew what he was talking about because my sister's car got broken in a couple weeks ago. <laughs> he also told me this one. He said, son, be careful. Don't act a fool in traffic because somebody will shoot you. Road rage is real in Atlanta. The reason that my dad gives me all of these warnings and he says it with a very serious tone and he makes sure that I'm paying attention is because he has concern for me. As a father, he wants to make sure that his child does not go out into the world without a warning of the danger that is imminent if I'm not careful, if my head isn't on a swivel and if I'm not paying attention. Now my dad is loving and kind, but my dad is not Jesus. Jesus says, I want you to be careful, not because I want you to judge the world around you, no, but because I have concern for you. I'm worried about you. I know that as you follow me, you have a temptation to behave in such a way publicly while being something else privately. Jesus offers this warning because of his love and concern for us. I thank God that we have a Savior that loves us enough to warn us about the things that can happen in our lives if we are not careful. He warns us because he has concern for us and because he loves us. And when someone gives you a hard truth, don't be upset with them. Thank them because it could save you in the process. Jesus says you can't practice your righteousness in front of the world as if you're perfect because then you'll forfeit the reward that God has for you on the other side. I thank God that he loves us enough to warn us about the imminent danger that could be in our lives. He says be careful not to practice your righteousness to be seen by others. Because if you want to be acknowledged by others for all that you do, then that will be your reward. But if you want a greater reward from me, which we'll talk about what that is later, then you need not practice your righteousness in front of others. Have you ever done something good just so you'd be noticed by someone, somebody or get a pat on the back? Oh, y'all all do everything with the right motive. This is not a rhetorical question. You can respond. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. 
I appreciate it. Bobby's always with me. I appreciate it, Bobby. Listen, I, I've never done that. I know y'all have, but I, I'm just kidding. I certainly have uh, done that. As a matter of fact, uh, years ago, my church back in Atlanta, it was around 2010, 2009 or so, uh, they, the single people would go downtown and they would feed the homeless people every Saturday. Um, I n- never went to do it, but then I found out there was a, a girl, a lady who was going uh, that I was interested in, and I was like, you know what, I think I might need to start feeding the homeless after all. <laughs> uh, so I sign up, I find out when they're going, I go downtown, um, and we feed the homeless, and y'all, I, I gotta admit, I was, I was on my game that day. I was on my game. <laughs> I'm walking up to homeless people, I'm praying for them, I'm showing concern and compassion, I'm handing them sandwiches and food, I'm looking everywhere I can because I want to be noticed, not by God, but by this lady. Uh, And lo and behold, she noticed me, (laughs) as you can believe, and um, (laughs) got a number. Four months later, uh, we were married, yes, so (laughs) praise the Lord, that's how I met my wife. Now, I won't get any credit from Jesus for that day I went down to feed the homeless, but I did get a wife out of the deal, okay? (laughs) But the point is this. (laughs) Feed the homeless, you'll find a wife. That's the point. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) This is what the point, the true point is this. (laughs) That when we practice our righteousness in front of others, we forfeit the reward that God has for us. That we should not pretend to be something for the sake of looking good in front of others. And there's a temptation to do that at every turn. And as we move to verse 2, Jesus gives an example of what it looked like in his day for people to do this. The first example we see in verse 2, it says, So when you give to the needy, don't announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites, everybody say hypocrites, do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. Jesus says, in giving to the needy, people would hire someone to play a trumpet and announce, look at how righteous he is. He is giving to the needy. And they did this to get attention from other people, thinking that the attention from the other people was the thing that mattered. The issue with this was that they were moved by recognition rather than compassion. That they wanted to be recognized. They didn't do it to help someone. They did it to help their own reputation. And Jesus calls them, listen to the word. It's a strong word. He says, you hypocrites. A hypocrite is a person in Jesus' day that would be an actor. They would play several different roles in a play. And they would play these roles in order to get the approval of other people. They never were actually who they were playing, but they were playing the role to get attention of people. And Jesus says we are hypocrites when we pretend to be something that we don't intend to be. That I pretend to be somebody who cares about the needy, but really it's about my recognition. That I pretend to care about other people, but it's really so I get the pat on the back. Jesus says we have to make sure that we don't practice our righteousness in such a way where we're pretending to be something that we have no intention to be. Jesus says be careful, don't play a role to be approved by other people. And how many of us have done other things for people's approval? We've tried to prove ourselves to be a kinder person than we actually are. Jesus says please do not practice this level of hypocrisy. This is showy spirituality. Y'all ever met showy spiritual folks? Uh, That they pray long prayers, as Jesus will talk about in a moment, that they give to the needy for a pat on the back, that they never do anything good if it's not seen by other people. Everything they do is private. Jesus says, stop being showy and be authentic. Uh, I frequently get asked this question since I moved here from Georgia. Uh, They say, people ask me, like, what's the difference between California and Georgia? And I tell them, not much, really. It's, it's not that much different. I mean, the taxes are higher here, but the weather is nicer, too, right? So you got to take one with the other. There's less humidity, but the people are the same. They're great people in California. They're great people in Georgia. They're jerks in California. They're jerks in Georgia. They're people who get on my nerves in California. People get on my nerves in Georgia. I mean, people are the same no matter where you go. But I've noticed one thing about California people that I appreciate. Y'all are a lot more authentic and real. Y'all don't really do the showy spirituality. I mean, look around this room. If you go to a church in Georgia, there are going to be some suits and people are going to be dressed up. The pastor is definitely not going to have on a pair of black and white shoes and a <laughs> sweatshirt. We know how to relax. I love that about California. Flip-flops at church regularly around here. Georgia, high heels, suits, ties, dressed to the nine. You got to get ready like you're going to the Oscars to go to church in Georgia. A little bit more showy. We got to look good externally. Something else about Georgia. Uh, People who attend church never drink in public, never. You just never see it. It, You go out to eat, people don't order drinks. But when they get home, they be drinking. (laughs) 
Oh, yeah. California, different story. Y'all go out, you have a drink. I see you, you don't try to hide it. Pastor, would you like a drink? Depends on who you are, I might tell you yes or no, how much I want to be a hypocrite or not. <laughs> but there's no need for us to show off. Hypocrisy is not a good thing. Why is hypocrisy wrong? Listen, it damages our ability to reach people with the gospel. One of the major criticisms of the church is that the church is full of hypocrites. People who say and do one thing and have one expectation, but they don't live up to it. And the reason we have to make sure who we are and who we say we are aligns is so that the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ can be spread. Why would somebody want to follow Jesus if you follow Jesus and you live a, a life that contradicts what Jesus says? We also have to avoid hypocrisy because it creates a culture of dishonesty. That when we're hypocritical and when somebody puts themselves on a religious pedestal, it may appear that they're this wonderful and great person and it creates a culture of dishonesty where people have to lie and act like they don't drink. I mean, the motto in the South is I don't smoke, I don't chew, and I don't date girls who do. That is the motto in the South. <laughs> and they're all doing all of that. <laughs> Hypocrisy is also wrong because it puts you on a religious pedestal. That's what these leaders were doing. They were putting themselves on a pedestal by giving to the needy and having the trumpet plays. They would have, uh, a, I'm trying to think of a famous trumpeteer. I had it in my mind. I forgot it. But they would have somebody who they would sign up. Louis Armstrong. There it is. Came to me. I've got some Louis Armstrong fans. Never heard a Louis Armstrong song in my life. I just know he plays the trumpet. <laughs> and they would hire him to walk the streets to show off, to put themselves on a pedestal. Aren't I wonderful giving to the needy? Here you are. God bless you. As if they were better than everybody else. Another reason that hypocrisy is wrong is because it prevents you from getting the forgiveness that you need. You can't confess a sin that you won't admit to. But Jesus says if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But when you're a hypocrite, you won't admit your sin. But Jesus says the only sin I can't forgive is the sin you won't admit. But when you have a willingness not to be a hypocrite, but to admit that I have problems, that I have been seen, that I need God in my life to save me, that is when your sins can be forgiven. Don't be a hypocrite, but be honest about your sin with God so that he can save you. That's why I love our Celebrate Recovery ministry. People show up to Celebrate Recovery knowing that they have issues. Shout out to Celebrate Recovery. And some of the most healthy people in our church are the people who go to Celebrate Recovery because weekly they're going to be held accountable and they have a, a culture that says we don't stand up like hypocrites and act like we're on a pedestal. No, we admit our need for God and he will forgive us. This passage is primarily about hypocrisy, but Jesus also makes the point that you should give. He says, when you give to the needy. When. Not if, but when. It's an expectation, and it all has been that way throughout all of Scripture. That generosity is at the heart of the people who follow Jesus. Continuing verse 3 and 4, Jesus says, but when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. Jesus says, do you want your reward from God or from man? But when I read this passage, I was a little bit confused. He says, don't let your right hand know what you're doing. But earlier in chapter 5, verse 16, he says, let your light so shine before men so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. Which one is it, Jesus? The same message. Two different messages that you're putting out here. Do I let people see what I'm doing? Or do I do it in secret? Jesus says, Jason, reread the passage and you'll get it. He says, let your light so shine before men so they may see your good works and do what? Glorify your Father who's in heaven. The problem that was happening here in this passage is that they wanted their good works to be seen by others so they could win the Philanthropist of the Year Award in Jerusalem, and that was the credit that they wanted to get. Jesus says your motivation matters. Are you doing good to be seen by others? Or are you doing good so others can see you but give me glory because that's what it's about? There's something... That's interesting today that happens in the world is that uh, people film themselves doing all sorts of good things for homeless people, for poor people, all these good deeds, and they film it and put it on social media. I don't know how I feel about it. You know why I don't know? Because I don't know their motivation. I don't know their heart. Perhaps they're doing it. What if they're doing it? To inspire others to do it for the needy. Wouldn't that be good? But maybe they're doing it to get likes and followers. I don't know. I can't judge that. I can't judge my own motives sometimes and I definitely can't judge yours. 
But all of us should individually examine our hearts to discover what is our motivation for doing what we are doing. Uh, there's a guy um, named Mr. Childress from Geraldine, Alabama. Anybody from Geraldine, Alabama in the room? Not a single soul, of course not. <laughs> While he was alive, he would go to the pharmacy every week, and when he'd go to the pharmacy, uh, he'd ask the pharmacist, is there ever time that people can't afford uh, their medication? She says yes. So each month he would give her uh, $100 in order to take care of uh, those who had needs. And a decade goes by, and as he gets sick, he has to tell his daughter, hey, I want you to go do this, continue to make sure that people have what they need. But he did it in secret because he didn't need it to be displayed to the world. He didn't need people to know. He just wanted to make sure that he was being kind. The story gets picked up after his death, and people now call the pharmacy in order to donate money. Why? Because giving is contagious. He didn't allow himself to be the promotion for what he was doing, but the word got out, and the Lord is being praised, and people are being taken care of. Don't allow yourself to practice your righteousness in front of others. Let God deal with the motives of others. And let him deal with your motives as well. Continuing verse 5 through 8, it says this, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. He uses that word again. Who love to pray standing in the synagogue and on the street corners to be seen by others. Now think about this. When you pray, who are you talking to? Uh-oh. <laughs> when you pray, who are you talking to? Okay. <laughs> I thought we might have to go back to basics here. But they would pray in public and pray loudly so everybody could hear to be like, oh, my goodness, this person is spiritual. Y'all met these folks before, the long, babbling, praying folks. Jesus says, avoid them at all costs for the same exact reasons that he talked about before. Verse 7, and when you pray, do not keep babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. No, you don't have to pray a whole bunch of words to be heard by Jesus. Sometimes the only prayer you can pray is, Lord, help. And that's enough. Because the Holy Spirit intercedes or speaks on our behalf. Sometimes I meet people and they tell me, I don't know how to pray, man. Just talk to God just like you talk to anybody else. And when next week, this is a preview, we're going to give you a preview of what it looks like from the Lord's Prayer of how to pray. At the end of the day, this is what we all need to do. We need to have a self-assessment of why we do what we do. Ask yourself these two questions. First question is this, are my actions being done to be seen by others or seen by God? Are my actions being done to be seen by others or seen by God? Colossians 3, 23 and 24 says this, And whatever you do, do it heartily, as for the Lord and not for man, knowing that from the Lord you receive your reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. All that you do, you do it for God. My mom literally beat this verse into me as a kid. She'd ask me to take the trash out. I'd take the trash out like a teenager does with a little bit of an attitude. She'd be like, boy, you better take that trash out as unto the Lord before I hit you. I don't know whether to praise God or duck, but anyway, <laughs> the next question I ask is, do I desire a human or heavenly reward? <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we almost appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Listen, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. One day we will stand before God, not for salvation, but for reward. You put your faith in Jesus Christ, you have salvation. You got that. You get eternal life. Thank God for that. But God is observing the things that we do to reward us based upon that. What are the rewards? I don't know, but it's going to be from God. It's going to be good. You are not going to get a reward from God and be like, oh, socks. <laughs> what is your motivation and what is moving you forward? Listen, God made his motivation clear in John 3, 16. He gave his son to the world. But what was his motivation? For God so loved. His motivation is always love. The answer that he gives us in the gift is salvation. Would you bow me for a word of prayer? Father in heaven, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the fact that we are a part of a body of believers that are doing the best we can to represent you in the world. Lord, we pray that you would search our hearts and show us where there are areas where We've been hypocrites where we've played a role or acted in order to look better than we really are. Lord, I pray that we would live a life of authenticity, that we would bring our sins and our concerns to you, not in a shameful manner, but no, but knowing that you are a loving father who cares for us. Lord, I thank you that you have told us to beware, to be on alert, to watch carefully, to observe our own lives. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't spend time testing the motivations of others without examining our own motivations. Lord, help us to represent you well in the world as salt and the light. Help us not to be pretenders, 
but to be authentic disciples and followers of you. That when we fall short, that we would come to you and admit our sin. If you're here this morning, you've never given your life to Christ. The Bible says this, those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Your salvation, God saving you from your sin, is a gift that he gives to all of us. And it's not based upon what you've done. It's based upon his work. That he died on the cross for you and he rose. My prayer for you today is that you make a decision to follow him. Father, for the rest of us, we ask again that we would be salt and light in this dark and twisted world. That we wouldn't be afraid of the darkness, but we'd let our light shine brightly so others would glorify you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. That's my time. Thank you so much for yours.